Good afternoon, Good Stephen. Afternoon. I have so many things that I want to hear from you. <laughs> but uh, we usually begin by asking the first questions about when you came to the ashram and how you came. See, the first time I came, it was in 1942, when I was eight years old. And I came with my parents, my younger sister and my brother. And we came only for about 15 days. And uh, that was the time when mother to me seemed like a fairy mother. And I had been seeing uh, fairies in our garden. We always lived in a house in Nairobi, in a big garden. And flowers and fairies always coexisted for me. But when I saw the mother, she looked like a fairy queen to begin with. But after a couple of days, something else got in. And I was old enough to be able to go into this midnight meditation. The midnight meditation used to take place at that time. My mother used to come out on the Dimanbai's terrace in the night. And there was no fixed time. But when we all went in the, say, somewhere about after finishing dining room food and all that time, I said, but 9, 9.30, that was approximately the time. And uh, my father and I would sit together. My younger sister was not allowed. My brother was, of course, too young. So we used to sit just under this service tree. And after a couple of days, I realized that everyone practically had fixed places. And there were very few people in the ashram in those days. And uh, as we sat down for meditation, I always had this repetition of uh, Shiva's name and uh, on the second day my father told me that whatever you are speaking you must not speak it loudly because people around you might get disturbed. So I did not know anything about meditation or anything. For me it was that when you pray you pray to Shiva. That was what had happened automatically. And uh, so slowly the mother became like a, uh, from a fairy queen, then uh, she became little more divine to my little uh, self. And then another very interesting thing happened during that trip and there were two transformation trees in the ashram compound. And the sadhaks, while going up and down with their work, would pick up transformation flowers. And then on the third day or so, I saw when we went for Mother's Pranam in the night, in the staircase, that people were carrying these flowers in the plate, and many of them had written something and put them in the plate. So the second day I asked my father, so my father said, these people are gathering these flowers and counting them and then they carry them to the mother. So second, then onward my sister and my, myself parked ourselves during the whole day in the ashram compound and as soon as a flower would fall, we will pick up and I'm sure we must have become quite unpopular among the grown-up people. But we were children and we were free, so we were most of the time there and then I requested my father to get me up little plate and my father said this is for ashram people it's not for us but then Purani ji told my father that if she wants to do it go to the bazaar and get a plate and give it to her so that was the beginning of my relationship with the flowers and the mother and uh, so we would take the flowers, wash them, arrange them, count them, and I put a little chit with my name and my sister's name in it. And then in the evening when we went to see her, then we would present her with this plate. So that was the transformation flowers. 
And at that time in the evening, when I saw the mother standing at the top of the staircase, she was dressed in a sari and she did not look like a fairy mother, but she looked like a goddess because of the atmosphere or a very dim light in the background and she looked so beautiful that I'd never seen anybody as beautiful as that even in pictures. So that was the beginning of my, in our own house there was always mother and show those photographs from before we were born because both my parents had been to the ashram before we were born. So the atmosphere was there and mother and Sri Aurobindo were the reveled people in the house. But the physical scene happened in 42. Then on the April Darshan, I saw Sri Aurobindo and the mother together, but I don't remember anything about Sri Aurobindo. Except that we were all asked to go in a particular line and not go very near and just remain at uh, a distance. And we carried, I remember we carried garlands. And uh, one gar the flower garland was to be put in one box and the uh, Tulsi garland was to be put in another uh, uh, box. And uh, if we carried any offering or something in an envelope, then we had to put it along with the flowers in this boxes. Now, you said you don't remember anything about Sri Aurobindo, but this was when you were eight years old yeah. in 1942. Yes. Did you see him after? No. You didn't have any other dogs? No. I came in 51 when he was not in his body. I came in 51 and then I stayed on. So, From 51 you stayed yes. So, uh, that 42 visit was for 15 days and uh, during that time I had fallen in love with the mother and I told my father I don't want to go back and I want to stay here and my father said you can't stay here, you see there are hardly any children here, you can't stay here. Once again, Purani Ji and Puja Lal intervened with my father and said, if she wants to stay, why don't you allow her to tell the mother? So my father said, all right, write to the mother. So in my broken language, I wrote a letter. And my sister said, put my name also in it. Oh. So I wrote a letter to the mother saying that both of us would like to stay with you and not go back with my parents. So mother told my father was allowed to go in the morning for private darshan also when we were not allowed. We were allowed only in the night. So when my father went for the darshan second day, next day, and I put this sheet in the, along with my flowers. Then mother said, your daughter has written a letter to me, do you know that? And my father couldn't believe that I'd actually done it. Because he had told me, no, you can't do it and you can't stay. So, mother told my father that if your wife stays, I'm going to open a school soon because other children are arriving, but I will have no boarding facilities for them. So if your wife stays, your daughters can stay here and go to the school. But of course, we'll come prepared only for 15 days and we'll come all the way from Africa. So there was no question. And my younger brother, my brother was only one and a half year old. So he was not even allowed inside the ashram. And my mother was not prepared for a long stay. So we went back. And, uh, but the ashram compound, the trees, particularly one tree which was in the rockery, which is the present rockery, there was a transformation tree there. That stayed in my memory practically all the time. I never thought later on as I grew up and I studied in a British school and all that, that I would ever come back and stay in the ashram. There was never a thought. So that was the first visit. And uh, many people ask me what I remember of Sri Aurobindo from my first visit. But 
I somehow or the other, maybe I was so full of flowers and mother that the memory of Sri Aurobindo is not been. I knew he was a god, and everyone went to him, and he was not seeing people every day, etc., etc., etc. So there was always a mystic aura around Sri Aurobindo's name, but that was that. <laughs> So in the nine years when you were in Nairobi, did you write to mother? Did you think about it? No. Her? Never thought of that I would come here and stay uh, because I was good at studies and in our family there was a lot of um, freedom moment uh, ideas floating because both my parents were freedom fighters. And they always talked about how Indian villages don't have doctors and they don't have enough medical facilities. And uh, so somehow on the way to studies, I formed a, an idea that I would like to become a doctor and go and stay in India in a village where there is no doctor. So, and I would talk about wanting to become a doctor in the house and my father would cajole me by saying, yes, yes, we'll see when you finish your O level. And then when the final year of the O level came, then I became more adamant that I'm definitely going for studies for medicine to India. Because I knew that by this time my father was not very enthusiastic about my coming for further studies to India. So there was a lot of discussion in the house and my father being a lawyer and I being the eldest child, he wanted me to become a lawyer and take over his practice so that, because by this time he was neck deep into politics and Sri Aurobindo's thought and the spreading of Sri Aurobindo's thought in Africa because we always had a center in our house where my father used to read some book or the other on a weekly basis. And he also used to go and give lectures on Mother and Sri Aurobindo's teachings in Theosophical Society, etc. Now this is around 1950? 1940, 1940. Uh, 49, 50, mm -hmm. this thing. So then uh, my father said whenever I met a, I wouldn't listen to Oh, I never wanted to become a lawyer and my father didn't want me to become a doctor. So my father said whenever I'm at a crossroad in my life about making a major decision, I ask the mother for a guidance. So let's do one thing. You go to Pondicherry, ask the mother whether you should go for medicine or whether you should go for law. And both of us must listen to what she says. Whatever her decision, the other must. So I said, all right, very happily, with a little idea in my mind that let me go to India. I was not thinking of the ashram or the mother at that time. But I thought, let me go away from home, go to India. Once I'm in India, then something will work out. And my love for India was not only because of the poverty and being wanting to become a doctor. But from my childhood, I had grown up with an idea of a friend who grew up with me, whom later on I realized was Shiva. So I knew in the back of my mind that I had to be in India and someday I had to go to the Himalayas. So that was the reason. And if I talked about going to Himalayas in those, when I was 16, Nobody was going to listen to me and it was a private secret within my heart. But coming to India, yes. So my father sent me to Pondicherry. Alone? With a friend of his who was coming. So I came. And uh, it was so surprising that mother had made arrangement for me to stay in Golkon. And Mona had actually questioned whether she's so young and she's come she's going to come miles away from her home, will she be able to abide by the rules of Golkon? 
And my father always stayed in Kolkata whenever he came for visits. He came quite often. Whenever he came for his political meetings with Nehru and uh, Gandhi and all that, he used to come always and uh, pay a visit to the ashram. So uh, when Mona asked, the mother said, she seems to be mature enough, so we will try. So I was taken to Golkon on the first day itself and I was given a room. And uh, I went to uh, at 9.30 or so, Mother came down for general pranam, so I went and uh, did my pranam to Mother. And uh, that was that. And in the evening, everyone gathered in the playground. So, when in those days, Mother used to go round distributing uh, ground nuts to everyone. So after the group member's turn was over, then she came to the visitors and the people who don't belong to the group. So the ladies in saris and all that. So when she came near me, then she said, don't you want to play with these other girls, like the other girls? This is on the second day of my visit to Pondicherry. I came on 17th November and 18th November in the evening, mother asked me this question. And I was good in sports in my school, and I used to be captain of the hockey team, etc. So I said, yes, mother. And then she just looked back, and Omeo was carrying the basin of groundnuts for mother to let it out to us. And behind Omeo was another gentleman. So mother just looked in that direction. Nothing was said. And she went on distributing. Then Temiben, who was also living in Golkon in those days, told me that mother has asked you to play, so you will have to go for your uniform. So I had no idea whatsoever. It was she who guided me that the gentleman who was behind that gentleman when mother, he is person who is in charge of stitching clothes for the playground, uniform for the playground. So he is in such and such a place, you have to go and give your measurement to him. So 19th morning, I went to Albert's department. He took my measurement. That evening itself, one shirt and one shawl was given to me in my hand by the mother in the playground. Means it was just like a magic. And hardly any words were, you know, mother did tell me, you go and give measurement or you wear a uniform. She just asked me one question, don't you want to play? And this is how the whole thing happened. So I joined the group. So every evening, five o'clock, during the day I would read. Vasanti became my friend because the library was in the ashram. This big library was not yet open. So the main library was in the ashram itself. So because I'm very fond of reading, so I would go there and take books to read. And whole day long I would read books, go to wherever mother went, because mother came in the morning for blessings, then she came, well before that she came for balcony, then the blessing downstairs, then playground, uh, the tennis ground. So we, I mean, as soon as she went to tennis ground, I would follow her and be there till she finished her game of tennis. Then she came to the playground, so I will go for my group activities and again that would. And in the night after food, mother came back, after our food in dining room, mother came back to ashram and we would be there, some of us would be there waiting for her to go up to her room. So she would get down from the car. So my life moved around mother's movement most of those times. And but then what happened to the doctor idea? Yes, that's what I'm coming to. I was staying here happily reading my books and uh, doing the games. Then my father wrote to Duman that my daughter is there and she's supposed to ask the mother some questions. So has she met the mother and asked her because since she has left, she has not written to us. They were not necessary to write home or anything, means I didn't find it necessary. So one day Duman came to Golkan and said, Sunanda, you want to speak to the mother? So I said, yes. Then I got a little note after two, three days, I will see you 
at 5.45 in the playground on this day, on Wednesday. So from my game straight, I went to the playground. My game was in the tennis ground. I went to the playground. And I sat in that interview room and mother came. And Narad, I made a mistake, the most beautiful mistake of my life when I spoke to the mother. I should have asked her whether I should go for studies of medicine or law. Instead of that, I asked her, Mother, shall I stay here or go outside to study? And as I say, I have always reminded myself it was the most beautiful mistake of my life. And the moment I spoke it, I realized that I was supposed to ask the other question. So then immediately I said, Mother, actually my father wants me to go to England for law and I don't want to go to law. England, I want to go to a medical college in India and I want to become a doctor and I want to um, treat the poor people, etc, etc. And you know, at 16, I had not seen the world. I had never been to a post office or to any school and back home. That was our domain because my parents were very Gandhian in their bringing up of the children. So I had no idea what was involved into the studies. I knew what medical books were and I had studied a lot of hygiene and philosophy, physiology and parts of the body. I had done the first aid courses which the school allowed etc. Et so, then mother said, you don't want to become a lawyer? And I said, no. And she just made a sign and said, we will not discuss that. Now, about your becoming a doctor. You may become a very good doctor, you may pass examination, you may become a good doctor, but there is something which I see in you just now, which you might lose. And she said, you may not, I looked at her with wide open eyes because she was talking about something which I didn't understand. Something in me means what? And at the back of the mind, oh, does she know my secret? Of my friend within me, that must have been there perhaps. Anyway, not outwardly. So she said, you may not be aware of this something, but I can see it. But you have to make up your mind. As far as the knowledge of medicine is concerned, I will make arrangement for you to learn it here. There was no medical school or college in Pondicherry in those days, except the little general hospital. We didn't even have clinics in Pondicherry in those days. And mother said this, and I had no knowledge of Pondicherry at all because my life was Golkon, ashram, back to Golkon, playground and back. And we girls were not even allowed to go beyond the canal to any shopping or anything like that. So I thought that's fine. And, but she gave me the full freedom. She said, you think, you make up your mind whether you want to go for further studies to Bombay or you want to stay here. So there and then itself, I said, Mother, if I decide to stay here, will you keep me? And she said, but I've already accepted you. So my mother had given me two gold bangles and a chain when we, in the Indian tradition, when a girl goes out, little bit of gold is generally given with that. So I took out that and put it in mother's lap. And I said, Mother, I don't want to go anywhere else. So, that, that was the sweet mistake I made. <laughs> Did your father ever talk to you about seeing Sri Aurobindo? Uh, no. But he always took it for granted that we children knew Mother and Sri Aurobindo because they were in our house most of the time. But we never discussed except when I was, as I said, a voracious reader. And I had, at a, at a strange moment in my life, I was afraid I'll read so many books that the books will be finished and I won't have anything else to read. So my father had taken me to his own library in his own room 
And that was the time when he realized I was reading a lot of poetry. And he gave me Savitri Cantos. The first Savitri Cantos had come out. And Prithvi Singh had sent that to my father. So he gave me that and he also gave me a tiny book of Sri Aurobindo's poems where there was the poem The Blue Bird and uh, one or two others which I remember. And I started reading, but that was the only thing I had read from Sri Aurobindo or from the mother. I had not read anything else before I came here. So then mother asked Nirod to teach me medicine. And Nirod, of course, by that time was already a sadhak and a sort of a rishi. After having spent all those times with Sri Aurobindo and dictation of the Savitri and everything, I had no knowledge. Mother said, Dr. Nirod will teach you medicine. So he gave me this thick book of anatomy. And I sat in the ashram and I read, and Yuman always used to laugh at me that Nirod came as a doctor and became a poet. Now we will see what happens to you. <laughs> and of course, by that time, Sri Aurobindo University Center, in those days, University Center, it was called Sri Aurobindo Uni International University, had started. And mother asked me to join those classes. So I joined the philosophy class and I joined the psychology class and English, of course, with Tammy. And uh, so I was full-time student and then playground. And then at some time, something happened and uh, somebody suggested that I must tell the mother whatever is happening to me. And uh, I was taken to the playground and during the marching then uh, she was told that I needed to see her and she took me to that small room and she said what's the matter then I told her what was happening and then mother said has this happened before I said yes once in a while it has happened like this but I was never scared of what was happening because I thought everyone has this life and uh, an inner life where you have your own companion and then you grow up together, etc., etc. But it never stopped me from coming or going or moving around. This was the first time when I was cycling and I was not able to reach the destination. And this happened at 4.30 in the, during the day. So when mother, when I told the mother, then she explained quite a few things. But that opened my door to going to mother regularly. She told me that whenever some such thing happens, when you receive something, sometimes I used to receive some things. And sometimes it was the psychological meeting and things like that. So when mother said, whenever such a thing happens, you come to me and tell me whatever is happening. And she also explained that there was a tendency in me to fly out of my body. So she told me on that first meeting when this incident took place that I'm putting a coat around you, an unseen coat around you. And she made this movement three times. And she said, you can come out in your imagination and jump up and down in this coat, but never try to break it and come out. I did not understand most of it, but I knew that she was safeguarding me from, a, from that incident which had happened, because that had put fear in me, without understanding anything at all. And I didn't understand it till more experiences came, my mother explained things to me, and that gave me the chance to go to mother more often. Mother said, you can come to me anytime when some such thing happens. So I used to go to her room and uh, tell her things that she would explain. And another, now coming to your question about Sri Aurobindo and uh, my relationship with uh, him, there were three pictures in the reception room when I came. One was the one which is there now, that 1920 portrait. 
and on two easels there were two photographs of Sri Aurobindo which were taken in 1950 after he left his body, both facing each other. And the one on the left hand side, which mother called Bliss, I could not see Sri Aurobindo in that picture. And I would rub my eyes and I would try all sorts of things, call Sri Aurobindo, call mother. But again and again my inner being went on calling Mahadevji. Mahadevji is another name for Shiva. So that was what was in my, in my heart all the time. Whenever there were, my mother had told me, whenever you are in trouble, you call the divine and the divine will be with you. I was scared of street dogs. So when we would go to the school and if I saw a dog, then this Mahadevji, Mahadevji, Mahadevji will start in my mind. And it became a habit in all problems, whatever. Whatever I wanted, whatever I was afraid of or anything, this would go on inside me. And that was what I was repeating in 1942 when I came and when I sat for with my father for meditation. That was the name I was calling Madhavji, Madhavji. But then when my father corrected me, of course, I said it inside. And I lost it for some time, this uh, repetition. I loved. But then much later on, when my mind understood what that name was, I got it back. But I used to also fast on Mondays. Monday is a day of Shankar, Shiva. So I used to do all sorts of fasting on Mondays, eating once a day or not eating at all, sometimes only drinking water. And so when I came here and saw only Shiva in that picture and not Sri Aurobindo, I was disturbed. And then on Monday in the evening when I said one day to the girl who was always coming with me to dining room to eat, said today I will only drink milk, I will not eat anything because I'm fasting. It's Monday. Then she came down like bricks on me. After coming to the ashram and accepting Mother and Sri Aurobindo, you cannot call any other divine and any other god. You have to be on, only faithful to Mother and Sri Aurobindo. I got so scared that I was doing something very wrong because by this time I was in love with Mother totally. Because she was the one person who had given me love which nobody on this earth had given. And I saw her giving love to everyone. And each one of us felt that she loves me the maximum. So all of us felt so fulfilled with the love which she was giving us. Then I felt guilty that what am I doing? I have asked mother to accept me and I'm here. And of course I had written to my father, I'm not going anywhere for studies, I'm staying in Pondicherry. And that was that. So then I asked mother once that I would like to talk to her about a problem. And then I told her about my not seeing sure. Then she asked me, she, she was mother who was behind me. And so she asked me, from when are you seeing this companion in you? And then, you know, blah, 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 blah. The whole story came out and I told mother from my childhood, he has grown up with me and it's when I was 12 or 13 that I realized that he was not an ordinary boy but he is a divine and that he is Shiva because there is a picture of him in my father's room and I associated myself with that picture and the two of them became together. And since then I started fasting and I started learning more about who is Shiva and he's the kindest of gods, etc, etc, etc. So then Mother said, where is this? Then I said, Mother, this is what I see in this picture and not Sri Aurobindo. So please do something so that I can wipe out this picture and I can see Sri Aurobindo as he is in that photograph. So Mother put her hand on my head for a long time. She pressed my head quite firmly and then I don't know how our time had passed but when we both came out of that uh, moment she said where is this picture and I said it's in Nairobi said, my father's picture not mine ask your father to send it then I was a naive baby so I said mother it's such a big picture how will he send it it is in a frame 
Then mother laughed and she said, your father will know how to send it. Then, then she told me, when we have beautiful pictures or beautiful calendars to send from one country to another, then there are boxes prepared for it. They will roll, your father will take it out of the frame, he will roll it, he will put it in this box and then he will post it and it will come very safely. Then the next question is, but it's not my picture, it is my father's picture. Then she said, you write to him and he will send it. But when it comes, I'm still staying in Golkum. So she said, when it comes, don't take it to your room, bring it to me. So that is what started my going to her at 10, 10, 30 in the morning. So I took this picture, went to her and she opened it with her scissors. And as soon as she opened this roll, and she'd only opened till here, and she said, no wonder you love him so much. So she saw the picture and she, and then there was a book next to her, where she was standing in the entrance upstairs, she was standing there. There was a book there and she took that book, I don't remember at all what book it was, and she had a white um, paper marker, uh, ivory paper marker, and she just did this, opened a page and she put her finger like this and said, read this. And the sentence which I read was from Sri Aurobindo saying, Shiva and I are one. Now, till today I don't know what that book was. But that cleared up many things in me. And I became free, then mother said, take it to the furniture department, get it framed and put it with my photo and Sri Aurobindo's photo. So it was putting gold coin in my room in that way and it is still with me. So that mother gave a whole turn to that aspect of my inner life. And then of course I studied in the uh, school and then I was given also the work to teach the children. And so I became a teacher. The medical science remained on one side. but. Nirod had told Satyavrat that there is a girl who is very much interested in medicine and her mother has asked me to teach her, but she can help you, you she can become your helper because she knows how to tie, figure off eight bandage and she knows how to, how to clean the wounds and things like that, she has learned in her first step and you can teach her something. So I was given to Satyavrat for some time. After Satyavrat then Dr. Sanyal came to uh, Pondicherry and settled here. Mother asked Dr. Sanya to start a medicine class for Ashramites who are interested in medicine. So Dr. Sanya became our professor and six of us became, even Pavitra came in that class in the beginning. So it was Pavitra and Sunanda at the two ends and in between there were four other people. So he even took us to the general hospital to show us the dissection of the body. So he took his work very seriously. And we learned the basic anatomy of the body and all that. Of course, no treatment or anything. But Nara, what is very surprising and why mother is the divine, Years and years and years passed and I got married, I went back to Nairobi, then I was in Shabda. We sold Shabda's books all over the world. And this medicine thing had been in the background and forgotten and I was quite happy doing whatever I was doing. I was very happy as a teacher, I was quite successful as a teacher. I was happy working in Shabda. But after mother left her body, all of a sudden, a healer comes to Pondicherry and somebody tells this healer that this lady has a daughter who suffers from asthma, so can you help her? So this gentleman says, come let us sit and talk. And then he just said, is she thin, is she bent on the shoulder like this? She had not seen my daughter, he had not seen my daughter, but I said yes. So these were the signs of a asthmatic patient, he thought. Anyway, he said, why don't you come and join the class? I'm taking this pranic healing course from tomorrow in the beach office. So why don't you join? 
I was looking after two departments at that time, Shabda and Shri Smriti, running between pillar and post. Hare Krishna had already left his body. So, there was no way I could have taken out three days, three continuous days. But he persuaded me and something in the night told me, let me see if I can learn something which will help Sachala, because Sachala was really suffering a lot during that time with her coughing. So I made up my mind that I will manage. So I did the course and after the first session itself, something happened to me. And a whole huge new avenue opened, which took me into this course in a big way. And the teacher also realized that, uh, and he asked me, when I talk about this different white light and green light, do you see light? I said, yes. So then he said, you are a clairvoyant, for you it will be easy to follow this. And so I did the three, all the three courses of, uh, and when I, then he said, you must heal people. And I took it up also that uh, if people needed some help, then I used to do pranic healing. And quite happily, and I improved in my own health, I improved in my outlook, my narrow outlook which was based only on my reading, etc. changed to, before that because of the chakras, I never touched anything to do with prana because I thought it has something to do with occultism and I am not supposed to touch occultism. This idea was there in a big way with me. Maybe because I am a timid person by nature, generally, you know, not outgoing. So maybe that was something which drew me back or whatever. But when I learnt this energy healing and the chakras, that was the first time when I realized that a huge chunk of my learning was left aside. So then I read up whatever she was doing, what they had said, and then I read up other things and all that. So, and one day I said, one day somebody said, after you started doing prani killing, you have changed a lot. And I was thinking, what, what outwardly has that person seen in me which makes him think that I'm changed? And I started introspecting myself and the answer was that the promised mother had given me that I'll teach you medical science here in the ashram has become true after all these years. And I was helping people, not with medicine, but because of my learn for it, I learned a lot of herbal things and flower remedies and this and that and the other thing. That's one side. Well, that's one thing I want to talk to you about in our next meeting yeah. about flower remedies, flowers, okay. yeah. and the fairies. Yeah. But for now, um, I wanted to ask you about a few of your remembrances of the oldest sadhaks, such as Nalini, Amrita, Parani. Um, Nalini, I don't know much except that I'd read one or two of his early books and I liked them very much because they were easy to follow. Amrita had always been extremely sweet person. As I saw him moving in the ashram, sometimes going for his bath and coming and all that, he always had a eternally a smile on his face. And one incident I can recall was that month after we came back from, after Bhagrishna and I came back from Nairobi when Mother asked us to come back and settle here. Bhagrishna was told by one of his old friends that when he turns 30, there was going to be a danger to his life. So wherever he is, he was here when this was told to him by a friend, an astrologer friend of his. Not an astrologer in a deep sense, but somebody who could uh, see uh, lines in the hands, perhaps. So this was, this Bhagavad had told me that, you know, somebody told me that when I turn 30, there is going to be a danger in my life. And he was always a very healthy person. You know. And we had both forgotten about this incident. When Balakrishna was turning 30, 30 and we were back in the ashram, 
I remember this suddenly. And that was the time when he had started travelling with Shabda work outside India. So I got a sort of a fear syndrome in me. And I decided that mother must have, during those days mother was not seeing people because she was not well. So she was only seeing birthday people and that also selective few. So on the 3rd December, 4th December is Bhagavishnu's birth and 3rd December evening, I was very restless and I thought somehow mother must know that he is entering this age in his life. What, when year, then, what year was this? Uh, 39. 60, 63, 63. So then mother was not seeing people, so there was no access to her at that time. So I wrote a note that somehow or the other this note must reach the mother before mother sees my Krishna tomorrow for his birthday. So I wrote and I was wondering who is going to take this to mother. And then I went to Amrita's room because Nalini and Amrita used to see mother in the evening with some very important papers, if there was something. So I gave this note to Amrita and he said, what is it? You know mother doesn't read anything nowadays and mother doesn't. I said, yes, I know. But I want you only to take it to mother's room. And I'll leave it as that. Then he said, what is this? He must have understood that unless it was very serious, I wouldn't have bothered him or bothered the mother. Then I said, it's open, Amritada, please see it. So he opened and it was a short note. And uh, I had said, please give him a special protection. So he said, no, mother must see this. He was so, so much open to this idea that it was necessary while the others were all you know shirking back taking anything to the mother during that time it was a difficult time also and then he took the note to mother and second day after my Krishna's birthday pranam when he came down he came with a special blessing packet which mother had given him and mother had told him that you are going out of India on for your trip Keep this blessing packet with you all the time on your body. So when he came, he had totally forgotten about this at Storm and I, I did not discuss and I didn't want to put any idea into his head because unnecessarily it would bother him. So when he came and he said, I don't know why mother gave me two blessing packets and this is what she has said about this. So then I told him, I said, uh, I had written requested her for a special protection. So, and then I made a little silk packet and then put the blessing packet in. So that was my, that is still my sweet memory of Amrita, that who would, he would always help as long as he could. So, so let's have another session uh, when it's convenient for you. Because we haven't even touched on flowers. Flowers, yet. yes, I know. <laughs> so, and we would, I know so many people who want to know about healing with flowers, mm -hmm. about your experiences with the fairies, and uh, flower remedies, yep. all of that. Thank you, Sinan. Not at all.